Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. For Dan Corcoran, a fascination with option pricing began in high school. By college, he was coding up pricing models and trading strategies in MATLAB. Compelled by the multi-dimensional set of inputs driving prices, in 2014, Dan set out to found Volos, the financial backtesting and consultancy firm he is now president of. Dan shares with us his love for ski jumping and the manner in which dynamic calculations of wind speed, of snow quality, and of lighting pitch among them must be made sometimes instantaneously. Likening this to option trading, he notes how quickly investors must react to changing risk parameters in derivative securities. Our conversation explores both the power and pitfalls of harnessing data to generate insights on trading strategies. Here, Dan asserts that no strategy can be static, but rather that investors must respond to the reality that the market's risk profile evolves over time. We turn to some of the results generated through the Volos engine, as Dan shares the counterintuitive result that even through the GFC, investors would have been better off not engaging in certain hedging strategies like put spreads. Here, the Warren Buffett saying, Price is what you pay, value is what you get, may be applicable as the sky-high price of options through that period reduce the value of the insurance payout. Lastly, we discuss benchmarking, a feature well entrenched in traditional markets like stocks and bonds, but nascent to option strategies. Here, Dan is both optimistic and excited that efforts to create benchmarks can lead to asset growth in derivatives-based investment strategies. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Dan Corcoran. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Dan Corcoran. He is the founder and president of Volos, a firm that's delivering backtesting solutions in derivatives, among other products, to institutional investors. Dan, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Delighted to be on. Yeah, this is going to be an exciting conversation. Your product is powerful. It's interesting. And, and we'll, we'll dive into some of what you're doing on behalf of clients as we get our conversation going. Let's just learn a little bit about you and your background. Tell us about the early days for Dan Corcoran, how you got your, your start in the industry and your journey. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks again, Dean. So quick background on Volos. We're a, a benchmark and software provider for institutional investors managing option strategies. And I started the business about seven years ago. I was in college and working on option strategies with a classmate of mine and ended up leaving school early, officially starting the business and through getting to know clients and trial and error and a lot of long days and weeks in the office, you know, built a business for doing that around, you know, all around options. And, you know, I think that it's always been fun for me. It's always been exciting in options. I think that options is really the thing that, that kind of drove me to start the business and for some background on myself, I grew up around Boston and, you know, when I was a kid, was really drawn naturally to skiing, ski jumping, and started doing a lot of competitions. And the jumping was the thing that was most exciting. And when I look back, I do think that, you know, when you come speeding into a jump, you're actually calculating a lot of dynamic risk factors. And sometimes the wind speed, the snow quality, the lighting pitch, and you have to make adjustments. And, you know, when I've gotten to know a lot of options investors, I think that there are a lot of interesting analogies when, you know, for example, your calculations don't line up and things turn sour and you can't be afraid to, to try and take a risky jump. But, you know, if you don't mitigate the, the risk factors in your control, then, then you could have a crash. So I think that the skiing was definitely something that, that drew me to options and really got hooked, honestly, into options. My first introduction to options was actually this. PBS Nova documentary on long-term capital that I watched when I was in high school. And pretty much ever since I saw that, my interest and passion shifted to options investing. That's great. And, and the analogy to skiing and ski jumping is really fascinating to hear. I'm a tad older than you. So, you know, I, I go back to the long-term capital days directly and having covered them and watched really right up close some of the epic miscalculations just in terms of let's just call it speed in terms of how quickly the markets can change, how quickly Greeks can impact portfolio dynamics. 
And I too uh, have found that documentary to be quite good. It, you know, really tells the story. So when you when you were in school, you had an introductory class to derivatives, and and they started to dive into modeling and such. Tell us just a little bit more about how you got hooked, as you said. Yeah. So essentially, in my my freshman year of college, I was fortunate enough to take a quant finance class taught by Morgan Stanley's interest rate derivatives team. And really, some top practitioners would come in and teach the class on everything from evaluating stochastic equations to how to arbitrage oil futures, and really were great at bridging the theory and the practice. And in that class, I met my co-founder, Seth, who at the time was a master's student studying pure mathematics. And Seth and I worked together basically, you know, after class for about a year or so, just designing and coding option strategies in MATLAB and found ourselves working on some optimization problems that kind of arise with, with options around kind of given an investor's view, what are the optimal options for expressing that view, you know, best return on investment for a particular view and really built some pretty interesting optimization software that we went out to market with and actually started showing to derivatives managers. And you know, what we learned was that the market was changing and they were really going from using OTC exotic options to listed options in a more systematic nature. And that sort of changed towards systematic investing when we officially started the business we really made a pretty deliberate shift in our focus towards systematic options investing and essentially working with investors to run a back test, a custom back test for their options strategy and say, how would options have supplemented your portfolio or performed in different times? And so that sort of custom back testing led to about three years ago, the business shifting those back tests into benchmark indexes that update on an ongoing basis. And so, you know, now the, the company, we find ourselves as, as a rapidly growing player for benchmark indexes that track option strategies and really, you know, excited to have, be working with some excellent clients for major banks, exchanges, asset managers, pensions, insurance companies, and really where we, in my view, have a competitive edge is in these options-based benchmark index is because of our, our dedicated focus to options and, and the technology for really rapidly customizing a strategy. So that's the overall kind of background and story. And I really do think it's good that we chose to focus in options and benchmark indexing. And, you know, I really think that there's a lot that that space overall, you know, has and represents for, for the future of, of investing. So definitely really enjoying what we're doing. Well, benchmarking has become such a giant part of the market. And certainly in the Delta One, just let's call it the stock side and, and the bond side as well. There's just a tremendous amount of capital that is directly, passively managed, literally replicating a benchmark. That's the reason for the strategy, whether it's a Vanguard fund, of course, the spiders and all the ETFs. And then there's a lot of quasi- benchmarking as well, but it's giant and it's in stocks, it's in bonds and, and it's in other asset classes as well, but not so much on the derivative side. So there's going to be a lot for us to explore in that realm. I want to go back to 2014, your founding of the company. I always just like to think of the time in which folks got started in the industry as at least somewhat impactful to how they think about markets. So when I go back to 2014, I'm thinking, Emergency QE is over, but QE is kind of here to stay as just a semi-permanent fixture in markets. We're worried about low inflation. Rates are still extremely low. The Fed can't get off zero. It's unclear if it's working, but it's certainly working on the vol side of the markets. Rate vol is coming down. The VIX is coming down. And so where I'm hoping to get you to comment on is as you started looking at back tests and looking at option strategies, you were kind of in a low vol environment, but the global financial crisis of 08 and 09 was still reasonably in the rear view. And then you had other reasonably large blowups as well, the flash crash in 2010, the sovereign crisis in 2011. So these things were 
in the rear view, but not far. And I'm just wondering if you can reflect back on that as you started to look at some of the data, thinking about back tests, what were some of the things that you encountered at that time in, in 2014? Really great question. And I think that what's happening in the markets now is actually analogous to what a lot of macro investors thought would happen 10 years ago, kind of post-financial crisis. Monetary policy has been kind of in place for a number of years. And just thinking back to when I was first learning about the markets kind of during the financial crisis, just living through it as basically a early high schooler, you know, learning about macroeconomics and the role that derivatives played and, you know, learning about credit default swaps and macro and the IMF and all this kind of was accelerated through a mentor of mine. I actually did an, an internship with him at, at this family office and he was a derivatives trader who had done credit derivatives trading at, at JP Morgan back in the 90s. And he really taught me a lot about macro. And it was kind of the attitude that gold was really in, some people were, were total gold bugs and some of those kind of turned out to be fallacies, but now those people don't necessarily look all that silly. And I guess where I'm going is, I think people thought there would be a lot more extreme macro events in 2012, you know, 2014. And it made sense why they did. And, and basically, really, in, in my view, it, you know, until about two years ago in COVID, from a macro standpoint, this whole kind of mosaic intertwines cause and effect macro relationships that have unwinded really since COVID around COVID, the markets didn't really change that much over the next 10 years since 2012 until, until about COVID. So, and people thought that they would, and a lot of macro folks kind of by 2016, 2017, 2018, pretty much a lot of the focus was really in kind of full systematic factor investing, premium investing. And that's how I saw the markets evolve kind of from a what was in flavor for attractive strategies. And now kind of the whole macro environment's back. And I think that's interesting. And at least for me personally, the part that was so interesting kind of with that bridging was also taking high school and college physics classes. And derivatives really brought the two together and learning about kind of taking a, a view on the path of a stock and bridging that with with some of you know what I was learning from physics and how that relates to option pricing models. That was really the things that came together for me in that period that were pretty interesting and inspiring. And our kind of our first software that we actually built was around that that bridge of taking a path dependent view. The stock's going to go up 10% over the first month, stay, stay there for the next month. And you know how to optimally express that view or you know really timing around events. And and kind of we put we mapped that into a kind of pricing framework for options for relative value and optimization analysis. And I think that that approach to investing is is somewhat complex. And in the market today where where things are have lost a lot at fundamental levels, you know, I think the doing the same thing over and over again isn't necessarily a great long-term investment strategy. And I think portfolio theory is definitely right for a change. And I think that also the factor investing and the premium investing is definitely onto something with respect to the diversification effect that different strategies can have instead of asset classes. And But that sort of forward analysis and planning around for the future is something I think investors were doing a lot back in 2012 and 2014 and are now being forced to do again, but people kind of changed their, their mindset. And that, that was at least my experience kind of coming into, into the financial industry for the first time. And I think this is a couple of places we can go with this. One is, again, if you're starting in 2014, the GFC is now in the data and 80, 81 VIX is in the data. Credit spreads just you know, completely gapping out is in the data. In 2011 is now in the data, but 2020 is not, right? The 83 VIX in 2020 is not in the data. And you'd said sort of portfolio construction and I'm just thinking about this incredible drawdown jointly in stock and bond prices this year. So in 2014, that 2022 drawdown is not in the data. And so this is where I'd love for you to share some thoughts just as, as you think about the backtesting part of Volos and engaging with clients and you know, clearly having the view that the data is, is valuable. It's important to look at. We wouldn't engage in backtesting if we didn't think that. But there is some grain of salt here that we have to be humble in terms of 
what we learn from these back tests. I'm curious if you can just reflect on that part of it, just trying to balance the, okay, there's always going to be an answer. There's going to be a trading strategy that wins at a given point in time, but it is the past. And so we can, our inferences, at least there's some limitation on the inferences. How do you think about the kind of balance of the value of backtesting and then just being kind of humble about what we don't know is coming yet? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's no static answer. Hedging, options, investing, it requires a continuous answer and continuous analysis. And and to be able to change a strategy over time is important. And I think that the past two years, if anything, have shown that active management is really worth its weight in salt because there haven't been a lot of passive strategies or do the same thing every month that really did work, some of them even through COVID. But the past, basically the past year to date, 2022, is kind of taken a lot of those strategies that on a back test or realized basis would have done really well, even pre-financial crisis and through the big shock in 18 and through December of 18 kind of period, which I'd say is, you know, I'd say more analogous to the environment of 2022. And then really through COVID and the incredible equities rally that, that followed COVID. And basically the back testing component, I think it's important that if people are going to put on trades, they want to know how did this trade do in the past. If people are going to make investments into systematic strategies, it's important to have the data and You know, what we found is just options investors need better benchmarks and they need better software to do that. It's not easy and trivial to do that right now. And so that's that's what we're we're excited about doing with our software. But I think that for testing more complex strategies or testing strategies that reflect active decision rules, those are the types of strategies that really sizing, timing, diversification convexity, they're all really some key parameters and option strategies that I do think that systematic investing, you know, really can provide a lot of helpful answers towards portfolio construction and having historical context is of big value. But these things on an ongoing basis as a benchmark also provide utility. And so we don't necessarily look at, we look at the historical components of a systematic strategy really, you know, definitely in backtesting framework. But I do think that for looking forward, systematic strategies really are, at least in the option space, having more and more active management rules in them where if you run a back test, those events may have only happened five, six times. You need to use key statistics and and have some uncertainty about, okay, how significant is this as a signal? How, How much alpha can I say there is in that if there are only a few samples? And I think that being aware of that's obviously incredibly important to do with back testing. But you know, I think that it's it's ultimately a definitely highly valuable tool. Let's start with the hedge side. So the expending premium to hopefully defend the portfolio in a significant enough drawdown. So if we're intellectually honest, we know hedging does cost money. And we obviously are in the business of trying to optimize the premium spend for what you get back in the case that the insurance does pay out. As you think about the systematic considerations for implementing, let's just say, a, a hedging strategy, what's been your experience? The levers that need to be thought through, maybe some of the things that you've learned along the way in running, I'm sure, thousands <laughs> of these back tests, maybe some of the nuances that you've come across that might be more important than are understood. Walk us through the, the hedging side and just in terms of how you and Volos think about the systematizing a hedging program? Yeah, I think that from a hedging standpoint, a lot of investors will will say something along the lines of, I'm comfortable with portfolio losses to 20%, but you know, after that, I want to be protected. And they've tried to essentially synthesize a put by selling as the markets go down. And in reality, I think that the kind of, explicit use of options has proved itself a number of times over the past two years, but also kind of exposed some of the drawbacks of options. And looking at it from kind of return decomposition standpoint, I do think that basically buying puts, explicit puts versus doing some dynamic replication, 
is kind of a key question where if investors say, I know I need this payoff if the markets are down by, by X or I want to be protected after X amount of losses, in certain assets like single name equities, the jump risks have been real, have been realized. Netflix, Facebook, two big examples. And then there's also the emergence of some right tail risk in commodities and other assets in, in single name equities as well. The right tails have been been pretty significant. And I do think that it really comes down to kind of is under my view of the world or some models view this you know, convexity, you know, this option cheaper rich, and you need to have a, a framework for evaluating them. What we've, you know, typically will test when we test hedging strategies would be something like dynamic replication versus buying options or buying put spreads. And, you know, one, one insight is that in the financial crisis, if you had bought, I think it was on SPY, EFA, and EEM, you know, 50%, 30%, 20%. And again, you know, most, global investor profile and bought 5%, 15% put spreads, six month options and you rolled them monthly, you would have actually ended up losing about 10% more in returns than the actual markets if you had just held those, those positions by even EEM. And the reason for that is either you got blown out in the kind of crash scenarios where it would blow past the, the cap of the, the put spread or you would be basically consistently paying too much high premium because the high balls and then, you know, thus losing more than if you were just long the market. And so somewhat counterintuitive, you know, puts have, you know, explicit puts have seemed to provide strong protection, obviously come at a cost and how to control that cost, either by funding it with other legs or by taking basis risk, either with other correlated assets or against some hedge benchmark. You know, those are the things that we really try and quantify so investors can be kind of have full visibility, not be necessarily without a point of reference. So those are some of the the key things we look at in tail hedge. You mentioned an example of tail hedging through the global financial crisis. And here's my question. When you go back to those periods and you run the data, first of all, it's very difficult to replicate the feeling of being in that chaos. (laughs) Liquidity is awful. It's really sometimes you draw the short straw and sometimes you get really lucky. And so as you you sort of run through hedging protocols, there is this, I guess, branch of research out there. Some people call it rebalancing luck, which is if I was about to rebalance puts on the XLF in early August of 2008, and then I just happened to wait a day. I believe the XLF was up 18% on one of those days when the market, there was some announcement, right? So so if your rebalance was the day before versus the day after, just dumb luck either made you worse off or better off. And I was just hoping you could reflect on, on that as you run all these simulations and scenarios. What have you found in terms of the sensitivity to the results based on rolling monthly or rolling quarterly that just considerations that we all have to choose, do you find that those do have a meaningful impact on ultimately the the output? They certainly can. Little wiggles can make a big difference in looking at at backtests. And so that's why a lot of option practitioners that run a systematic strategy trying to harness something, you know, you got to use multiple expirations. You got to have frequent roles. And so you're trying to avoid market timing and, and basically a change in the average profile of your exposure for the most part. I think that there are some timing rules that, however, can be really useful and can be kind of properly exploited. And, you know, some examples would be looking at mean reversion in some, you know, volatility events or volatility type trades. And, you know, there are times where, okay, if your hedge portfolio is up over 20x, then maybe you want to incorporate a rule that sells 50% of your position to monetize your gains. And, you know, whether that's lucky timing or not, you know, I think that really has to do more with does a timing decision impact the investor's objectives and utility function, or is it something that is more arbitrary? And should I do this on a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday? And the, the data, most of the time, 
can show different return profiles of strategies over the long run just because of one or two small differences. But, you know, we found that generally markets are pretty efficient. And with respect to no major differences between, for example, a put right and a long call synthetic, you know, things track the market pretty well. Things are efficiently priced, but there aren't, you know, there aren't a lot of, at least in the back test space, you definitely want to to make sure you shuffle some parameters and get an understanding of the standard errors and whatnot. Well, I want to shift to some of the work that you're doing in complex indexation and benchmarking, but let's stay with the, the hedging side for a little bit more. We talked about the GFC. We know that this year is a 20 odd percent drawdown in the S&P, 30 plus percent in the, in the NDX. Generally speaking, people are pretty unhappy with the performance of, of hedges. It's just not been a great year, certainly relative to the size of this drawdown. Hedging has really not felt as profitable in the sense of reducing losses as you'd expect it to. So why don't you talk to us about what you've learned about hedges through some of these different events? You'd also mentioned the XIV event, which is a pretty unique one in Feb 18. Walk us through some some metrics that you've come across in, in terms of almost a side-by-side for how these hedges work through these different risk-off periods. What can you tell us about you know, what you found in terms of backtesting hedges through these big vol episodes? It's a definitely relevant question. The market right now, a lot of option strategies, if we just look back one year, right, bonds were really the bubble. And it's, you know, the fact that both stocks and bonds have gone down at the same time, that has been the real tail event, not like a shock in the markets, right? And those basically crash protection tail hedges haven't paid off and the premiums have been high because volatility has been fairly elevated. And, you know, some of these options have been efficiently priced. And there have been strategies that it's interesting that that really the first half of the year was the killer for a lot of them. So, for for example, short straddles on the S&P were actually up from November of 21 to May of 22, 14% short straddles. And then, you know, since May of this past year, spy straddles have been up about 20%. You know, but was the nature of the equity market all that different from last November to May and then from May to, to now this November? Not really. And and so it's really the most interesting time to be looking at option strategies and investors that have gotten creative and have gone into single names and have gone into credit or sector ETFs and there's been certainly money to be made in certain options trading strategies in, in areas of the market. But for broad equity hedging with puts, it's been a tough strategy. And a lot of the shortfall strategies that were around before COVID aren't as much in the marketplace anymore as well. But investors are, are hedged. They've just been, haven't been getting home runs on those hedges. Yeah, hey, you mentioned selling straddles and just how counterintuitive that is to be profitable in an environment where you've had such a a large drawdown. And the derivative of that derivative trade is selling straddles on the VIX. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I believe that strategy has also been exceptionally profitable. You know, it's a high VIX, but it's also a range bound VIX at a high level, which is pretty interesting. And it's very different than where we were. We, we, We had gone through these periods of kind of lurching from one crisis period to another. And those periods sometimes were longer, sometimes were shorter, but the VIX would fly up into the 30s and 40s. And then typically some policymaker response would put the market at ease. And then just as soon as, if you let's say owned VIX calls, just as soon as they made money, you had to ditch them quickly because they were going to crater. And so there were these periods where the VIX the changes in the VIX over short periods of time, both to the upside and then crashing down, that got to be a common theme in the market. And you know, here we are kind of range bound in the mid to high 20s. It's pretty interesting. Let's talk about some of the indexation that work you've done. The way I'd like to frame this is Volos was a generous sponsor of a, a conference I hosted on behalf of the charity I started, Macro Minds. I'm, I'm grateful to you and the team for 
helping us raise money on behalf of student education. One of the panels featured was on QIS strategies, this Wall Street Innovation Quantitative Investment Strategy groups that really, I think, are doing some pretty fascinating stuff well above my head in a lot of ways that looks at harnessing risk premia, complex risk premia in commodities and you know, correlations and so forth. So with that as just the, the framing, I'd love for you just to tell us more about what Volos is doing in the area of complex indexation. Dean, let me start by saying really appreciate you hosting that conference. I, I thought it was really a success and you know a lot of interesting perspectives at a pretty important time in the market, which was in, in May of this past year. And I think you know some of the attendees really had some some good wisdom about what continued to happen in the markets and had good foresight there. And as far as what Volos is doing in the the indexing space, it's really using benchmarks and indexes as a tool to to basically have conversations about the markets like what we're having and which option strategies are performative and which aren't. If you want to test your hypothesis, you know, investors are able to kind of be in control of that process from just doing the software and the modeling themselves and really able to work on on doing that that sort of continuous analysis to their their strategies, particularly in, in options. And I think that, you know, it is in the details of the strategy. There, you know, there hasn't been an easy answer in option strategies for the past two, three years, and the environments have changed a lot. You want the robustness in that. I do think really comes down to the sizing approaches, monetization, timing, intraday, I think is going to be increasingly important in finding really a, a factor kind of balance and really balanced risk and, and balanced correlation profiles that are more robust than just regular asset class investing or, or style investing. And I think that those strategies, you know, are continuing to evolve and the mechanism of, of risk control for balancing these strategies, I think has, is a good framework. But I think a lot of, a lot of strategies that were in the kind of QIS alternative risk premia buckets did become correlated for periods of time and, you know, didn't, didn't hold up to what they were necessarily doing historically and just sort of having that in, you know, kind of the main trading factors in Delta one is kind of what's comprised most of those bank indexes in the QIS indexes, but adding options is something that, you know, has also been done to a good extent. And a lot of the benchmarking that those strategies do will, will contain rules such as, you know, go buy a put off in every single day and, to try and balance out that that sort of timing factor and, and get, you know, an isolated exposure, they'll delta hedge the index. And so it's really, they can really be signed and tailored and customized. And what's exciting about what we're doing from Volus' standpoint, we really do two things. We work both with the, the banks and the QIS desks to be an independent index calculator for them. We're working with a number of banks on, on that side. And on the other really working with the end investors to allow them to build benchmarks that they can then go bring to those liquidity providers and systematic strategies to obtain obtain pricing or kind of design the strategy themselves instead of necessarily relying on on the banks. And I think that's that basically being able to do your own benchmarking, being able to design the strategies yourself from a buy state standpoint is is definitely where a lot of things are going and you know the strategies that are coming out I think are are getting more intelligent and you know it's a pretty pretty exciting time to be there. I think that it's been a much wider adopted product in Europe for a long time, but in the United States, you know, large insurance companies have really made good use of the QIS and now more pensions and asset managers are doing so through the use of strategies that can also help save operational costs for trading, having a synthetic exposure via total return swap or principal protected note. So definitely a lot of innovation happening in the space and there's definitely some utility to doing that type of trading. But, you know, it's a complex thing that is, you know, really interesting to talk about. Well, you guys are doing indexation that is on the more transparent and, and more simple side, which would, let's just call that listed option overlays. So I want to talk about that and then maybe we'll get into the the sexier stuff, the more kind of QIS stuff that might embed some something more complicated. 
is we look at the overlay index, the family of indices that are just option overlays. One of them I'm looking at is your, your collar index. Now, this one is near and dear to my heart because you know, I've been looking at collars. So just simple buy, put, sell, call. And you know that pricing has really gotten interesting. It's not to argue in any way that there's just free money. There's not a lot of free money in the market. <laughs> but you, know, you kind of take what the market gives you in terms of the price of vol. And whatever is the reason, people have a lot of different explanations for the why, but that skew in the S&P 500 option complex has really flattened out. And so as the buyer of the put, seller of the call, the economics have really come your way at a time when rates have gone up, which further betters the collar pricing. So when you look at your family of, let's say, collar indices, what have you done there? And then how would an investor utilize and and kind of consume that product? Yeah, so I think that's the other side of it. And really a much broader trend about investors' use of options overall. And really think options are surging in popularity for a lot of end investors through ETFs. And there are now over $60 billion in assets in ETFs that hold options themselves. And really, that's where, you know, Volos has been able to provide a service of creating uh, benchmarks that those exchange-traded funds can track to implement an option strategy like a caller. And so we have a number of partners in the ETF space that are ETF sponsors or, or executing service providers or sub-advisors that will essentially package a four-letter ETF that can be brought to their high net worth retail wealth manager networks. And these managers now have access to options before, you know, these ETFs. And again, there, there's some in mutual funds, but it wasn't as explicit. These are really well-defined strategies. They can go and retain the benefits of options, like, for example, a caller, and it really translates fundamentally to their end client. And that caller, as a replacement for equity, really represents a trade-off in that investor's objective where protection of safety net against major drawdowns, they can't afford them. And that really provides an end benefit to then investors and that accessibility, not having to roll the option, size them, do the risk management, the strike selection, all this stuff. They can focus on basically you know, being able to access the benefits of, of option strategies. So I think the ETFs is really the, you know, one of the really exciting sides. I mean, the growth there has been pretty significant from an asset growth standpoint. I think we'll continue to see some pretty interesting products come out there. It's, uh, as I said, there's, there's no free money that is obviously coming out of the market, but to be able to tailor your exposure to some risk return trade-off that is more suitable to you is just a great thing that strategies like collars and and many others allow the investor to access. Talk to us a little bit more about some of the more complicated work that you guys are doing, just in terms of whether it's things that a large bank might be engaged with you on in the QIS front. Some of that data is not as obviously generated through the tape, so to speak. Walk us through how you engage with, let's say, banks on on the QIS front. And one last thought on the ETFs before we switch over. Again, my biggest lesson learned from running this business has definitely been simpler is better most of the time. And I do think that in the big picture of of investing, most investors really at the end of the day are investing in stocks, bonds, geographies. And I think that a major shift that's happened with ETFs and the liquidity of options on ETFs that didn't really exist before the financial crisis, but now has over a quarter of a trillion dollars in daily notional volume, these liquid ETF options really cover those main asset classes, geography sectors that investors can. And and basically, you know, really think that options... Looking to develop um, new systematic option strategies for your clients or to launch a new ETF or structured product? You know, during a period like COVID, when the markets are down almost 50%, determine whether to basically pull all the money out of the market to, to have to fund necessary expenses. And it can give the, the peace of mind and the utility in a pretty transparent form and kind of with pretty well, you know, really robust liquidity. I think that that's just as far as how investors invest, I think will be 
you know, a likely driver in is kind of the evolution of how definitely the next generation of investors invest as well, individuals that use options. It's definitely pretty exciting to see what those macro trends and options will be. And I think a lot of what's been over the past two years transitioning to the really complex side has been the supply and demand imbalances with options in the market effects that that's caused in people's kind of aggregate Greek exposures and dealer hedging flows. And those are the things that I think really have been interesting areas in kind of looking at institutional trading programs that rebalance with certain rules like volatility targeting or trend following and how that's basically had potential impacts on price and volatility and factor returns. That's an area where I think it is complex, it's dynamic, it involves the market participants. But with respect to options, you know, you've had different factions that have come really large false sellers at certain periods, you know, sophisticated macro tail hedge managers, insurance companies that now are, you know, going to be able to do more hedging with higher rates. And, you know, I think it's it's that sort of options ecosystem that makes it pretty interesting. And, you know, that's where I think the complexity is. You make a great point there. And I think this is a, a topic we've covered on this podcast in many formats, which is, you know, Black-Scholes is, is a physics equation, but markets are not physical sciences, they demand interaction from the participants, as you said. And that interaction in the sort of idea of George Soros creates reflexive outcomes. And you mentioned option trading, but you also hit on quasi-option trading, risk management strategies that interact with the marketplace. Could be vol targeting, CTAs. They could create momentum in asset prices. Sometimes they drown it out. And you also use the word ecosystem, which I really like, this supply side and demand side for optionality at different points in the curve, both the strike curve and the expiration curve. And ultimately, a a clearing price is going to emerge. But trying to get your arms around how that evolves, I think, is is interesting. What have you guys seen just in the non-option, so non-premium oriented option strategies, but ones that in some ways, try to behave like option trades, whether they're, again, while targeting strategies, let's just start with there. Is that an area that you guys have spent some time looking at? Are you seeing interest in that from the conversations you have with clients? Yeah, we definitely do work there. Vol control, I think, is a really great way to think about sizing strategic asset allocation. And we we do work with some of those systematic investors and the vol risk premia space with more kind of structured strategies around either dispersion or volatility risk premia or, or taking volatility factor bets. And, and I, I think that those sorts of flows, there are some, you know, situations where it really is, you know, a small number of players in certain areas of the market that are, you know, buying or selling a lot of volatility. And sometimes when those players are out of the market, I think that the, the spillover effect essentially from volatility, explicit volatility trading, you know, to the broader market and the relatedness of the different instruments, kind of the leverage created around them with, you know, ETF and index options, as well as explicit, you know, vol trading. It's something that also kind of has a potential volatility dampening effect, which I think has been the case basically during the, the you know, it's called post-financial crisis pre-COVID period where a lot of those, you know, feedback loops, perpetual flows have basically created in some areas of the market, you know, had an impact on return. And I think that that as basically a primary market driving force is not usually true. And there was, you know, look at in single stock trading. It was really, you know, active hedge funds, large blocks in some major manager rebalances. But the price impact, you know, really from things like basic ETFs that are systematic, I don't think is as significant as sometimes the impact from these really large futures trading programs, CTAs, fall control, that sort of rebalancing. I do think was definitely something that I certainly don't have the answers to, but when you when you think about reflexivity and how to model this, I really would love to basically 
share my, my view on the reflexivity kind of framework side. It will probably be a, a minute or two to, to nerd out on it, but overall, curious on your thoughts on these trends as well. Well, tell us about your views on reflexivity. It's certainly a important component of my own thought process. I find all of the analysis of the, I guess I would just say the, the big finger pointing at the market as causing moves to be justified in the sense that we know what short gamma hedging is and long gamma hedging is in terms of vol accelerant and vol dampening. I do find it hard sometimes to get comfortable with how specific the numbers are, but it's incredibly clear that especially for volatility periods where folks have to react and they have to do so in a hurry and there's enough, let's just stay with short vol exposure out there, that de-risking can become a thing of its own in a hurry. And certainly positioning, while again, I, I find it difficult to pinpoint positioning, I always point to the prevalence of OTC derivatives that we'll just never see the light of day, really. You just don't know who has what on. You see the listed stuff. So I think the logic is very sound, and I think it matters, with the caveat that some of the analysis I see out there is a little too exact in terms of published numbers and so forth. But I'd I'd love to get your take as well. Yeah, I think the practical side of it, I do think is really important as well. And it's important that people have these conversations about what's the potential risk to the system with evolution of derivatives earlier rather than later. And I think that those are important lessons, especially when complexity increases in some areas. And it's more clear that there are these sorts of market dynamics from kind of the reflexivity standpoint, market participants and having a model, you know, basically the, the information ratio is really the main thing that if you say market participants are looking to, to maximize their, their information ratio, breaking that down into basically their information coefficient, how good they are at, at basically mapping their expected returns and, and realized returns and how often the trading and, and also the transfer coefficient, which is their ability, potential constraints. And so that, that sort of Grinnold and Kahn framework, I think the information coefficient and the theory of reflexivity of market participants having a forward-looking view, that's some subjective probability that may be influenced by other market participants and may be influenced, you know, also by, may not be a market participant at all, but maybe some systematic strategy that needs to react in some way, I think that that's more on the transfer coefficient side because it's more the constraints on the on the program. And so that difference between the two is, is really, in my view, the, the active investor versus the rules base. And as more assets go into the rules base, that you know, potentially could change the market dynamic. And I think it has volatility investing. But, you know, kind of getting into the, the interesting part about, you know, options and modeling an option like a a particle and kind of the origins of the, the physics side of the Soros reflexivity theory. It's, you know, call or put is like a, you know, hydrogen and volatility is the parameter. It's a closed formula. And then you get into basically what's that forecasted probability distribution versus what's the markets. And that's where I think in basically investors transfer coefficient being also proportional to their, their assets that they can invest in the network. So in this sort of an agent model, I think that there are good theories coming out around a good frameworks and something that's been pretty well studied in a lot of different ways. But I'd say the main thing in my view with respect to volatility from kind of a overall financial system point of view, if there were problems that emerged because of these derivatives, I remember having conversations during COVID with, with individuals we're talking about, is the Fed going to go basically sell VIX futures? Again, I was at the ETF conference in January of 22, and no one was talking about the Federal Reserve buying ETFs. And then two years after COVID go by, and, and no one was talking about it again. People had seemed to forgot that it said, you know, went out and bought ETFs and bought basically the volatility component. And again, I, I think that so far we haven't necessarily seen this other than basically February of 18, this volatility get to truly dislocated or out of control, I think that it's not necessarily an inefficient market. It's just more, it's a, you know, interlinked and in, in complex one. So definitely, you know, an area that I think is pretty, pretty fascinating. And also the growth of asset managers just basically over the past 
you know, 20 years has been pretty significant as far as where risk potentially has shifted away from seems like a lot on the banking side is obviously important here. And so, again, I, I think that there are people that are much, much smarter than myself out there that have a, a pretty good view of that that whole picture. And from my standpoint, I, I do think at least on the options and volatility side, it's evolved pretty significantly over the past five years. But some of these problems aren't the same, you know, hedges being expensive. And I do think the biggest thing that's changing that really is, you know, fundamentally is rates and inflation. And, you know, I think it's really to be seen what the long-term impacts are there, but it's definitely a somewhat uncertain time that we're in right now in November of 22. Well, as we round out the conversation, give us a minute just on the plans for the team and the, the growth of your product suite. If it's T plus a year or two, what are some of the innovations that you're hoping to bring to the market based on whether it's client demand or, as you say, an always changing set of market circumstances? Yeah, thanks. We're really excited to be rolling out fully our, our back tester engine and really allows institutional investors to test their active rules, get really creative with how they put together these options strategies and how they size them and you know have one leg pay for the other and do the dynamic replication and delta hedging and, and really see visually, really with one click and second, the performance of different types of, of option strategies to be to be more informed in, in designing these programs. So the team right now, we have 12 and, and 30 kind of individual independent investors in the company and pretty excited to be growing our institutional partnerships with, with groups like NASDAQ. It's been an excellent partner and bring more more products and, and strategies to market and really allow, you know, benchmarks to help them tell a story to, you know, their clients about why options make sense and hopefully use these benchmarks to help facilitate, you know, more allocations and, and option strategies that are really can be beneficial to end investors. Outstanding. Well, Dan, this has been a pleasure to, to spend the hour with you and best wishes in growing the, the product and the service. And it's Volo Software, V-O-L-O-S, software.com. And congrats on being an innovator in, in our market. So thanks for being a guest today. Really appreciate it, Dean. You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time. Mm-hmm.